One of Fallout's most defining factions are its raiders. Roving bands of bandits, scavengers, and psychos led by despotic wasteland warlords. Unfortunately, most raider groups throughout the series have been reduced to minor roles though, often appearing as nameless, low-level enemies that act as nothing more than generic cannon fodder. This is a trend that can be traced back to the first century, where there was only a single major faction of raiders, the Khans, a band of slavers who raid villages and traffic the survivors. However, the designers once planned two additional raider clans who were at war with the Khans, neither of which ever saw the light of day. This is Fallout's Cut Raiders. In today's video, we're taking a look at two cut raider groups, the Vipers and the Jackals, who were made by designers Jesse Heinig, Scott Campbell, and Brian Freyermuth, the latter two of which also worked on one of the game's other sadly cut factions, the mutated talking raccoon clan known as the Salanter. The origin of these cut raiders begins at Vault 15, and a hollow disk found at the hub details the location's construction, stating, Due east from Vault 13, construction on this vault has gone extremely smoothly. Much work was done to reinforce the walls of the third level of this vault to make all the future vault dwellers more secure in the knowledge that in the event of even a major earthquake, the regulatory computers of the vault would continue to function. Recent tours of the newly constructed vault have had many a potential vault dweller walking away with a newfound awe of the improvements done to this already impressive vault. vault Tech's social experiment for Vault 15 was never revealed in-game, but the first entry of the Fallout Bible did show its true purpose. Quote, Vault 15, intended to stay closed for 50 years and include people of radically diverse ideologies. Gathered from what you hear from Aradesh in Fallout 1, he has quite a bit of multicultural flavoring to his speech. Unquote. When the Great War occurred on October 3rd, 2077, this racially and culturally diverse group arrived at Vault 15 and were sealed inside. They attempted to communicate with the other vaults, but were unable to do so. In early 2097, a schism occurred between Vault 15's population. The majority of the group stripped the vault of anything useful, including a Garden of Eden creation kit, then headed out into the wasteland. A small portion of the vault dweller stayed behind and attempted to survive in the now raided vault. Katrina, one of the NPCs who greets the player at the entrance of Shady Sands, was one of the vault's inhabitants and she gives the protagonist additional information about this event, saying, My life was very boring. I was raised in a vault. I lived there for many years. Unfortunately, we were crowded and life was very bad. There was a schism and many people left taking with them the best equipment. Still, some of us tried to stay in the vault, but then we were attacked. I was hurt, and I ended up here. Now I try to help people. Those who initially left Vault 15 would go on to found their own settlements, most notably Shady Sands, while the others would band together and become villainous raiders, forming the Khans, the Vipers, and the Jackals. All three raider groups were originally intended to appear in the first game, but both the Vipers and Jackals were cut, and only the Khans ended up appearing. In Josh Sawyer's tabletop RPG, he made a logo for the Vipers, but considering this was made by an entirely different developer, their logo probably would have appeared differently. Despite being cut, multiple raider groups are still mentioned in the dialogue of various characters. Seth, the front gate guard at Shady Sands, still comments that, There are several groups of raiders. I organize guards like Ian to help fight them off. There is one band to the southeast of here. Watch out for them. Ian references them as well by saying, There are several different groups of raiders out there. The most organized group is called the Khans. They seem to think they can conquer the world or something. Aradesh, the leader of Shady Sands, mentions the Vipers by name and comments that no one knows where their base is located. <clears throat> Very bad. There are two bands of raiders that we know of. They call themselves the Vipers 
and the Khans. Mm, yes, yes, the Khans are nastier than the Vipers, let me tell you. These barbarians attack from the southeast. Be very careful with such as these. Raiders who are fanatically religious can be quite dangerous. No one here knows of their base. Shady Sands features a quest where the protagonist has to rescue Aradesh's daughter Tandy from the Khans. Considering the Vipers and Jackals were also harassing Shady Sands, it seems possible there would have been additional quests where the player needed to fight these cut raiders to ensure the village's safety. Unfortunately, the few lines that do reference the Vipers provide very little information about them beyond this. Most of what we know about the faction stems from the Fallout Bible, and in it, it details their backstory stating, quote, 64 years ago, a man named Jonathan Faust led his group of about 200 people from the overcrowded vault into the waste of the outside. It was there that his small band came to a small oasis in the middle of the desert. In the middle of this oasis was a large pit, almost like a crater. While resting and setting up camp, Faust decided to look into the pit. Darkness greeted him. When a member of the band called out to him, Faust turned, startled, and slipped into the pit. He slid down 20 feet and then fell another 20 and broke his leg in the process. As he lay there dazed, a half dozen gigantic pit vipers slithered towards him. Not knowing what these things were, Faust was terrified. The group above heard one loud scream and then nothing. Three others went to look for him but never came out. The small band, leaderless and stuck in the desert with no food and water, decided to stay at the oasis, at least for a little while. They covered the pit with a tarp and nailed spikes around it to keep whatever horror lived there in case there. They then set up their camp as far away from the pit as possible. Whatever was down in the pit never bothered them. Days passed. The more influential of the group argued about what they were to do. There was talk of joining up with others from the vault. There was talk about going back to the vault. During these four days, almost one-fourth of the group was either dying or already dead. Those who survived the radiation poisoning were too weak to travel, while those who survived either left or stayed and helped defend the little settlement against the desert creatures. Finally, after a week, the remaining members of the group decided to move on. They started to pack their belongings when an almost spectral figure emerged from the shadows. It was Faust, except this was not the strong leader they remembered. He was wan, pale, and emaciated, and there was a feverish gleam in his eyes. He told them that when he was down in the pit, a god visited him and told him the true way. They would make sacrifices to the gods of the pit, and wealth and happiness would be theirs. Of course everyone was skeptical, some were even violently rebellious, saying that Faust was crazy. After Faust patiently listened to them, he then whistled, and from behind him came two very large pet vipers. Without warning, they struck. They attacked everyone in the group, including Faust, but he just laughed as they bit his flesh. As the sun rose the next day, the two snakes lay dead by Faust's hands. Half of his people were dead, the other half were on the brink of death as the pit venom started to sink into their systems. By that afternoon, most would be dead, but the 40 or so survivors of the venom were half crazy with the after effects of the venom. Faust, himself immune to the venom, helped the remaining few through this time, which has come to be known as the Great Awakening. He whispered things to them, told them how the Great Snake has spared their lives so they would fight for his mighty cause, and thus the Viper Clan was born. They decided to make the pet their shrine and to go out into the waste and take what they needed from those blasphemers who did not follow the winding way of the Great Snake. When Faust, or the Great Snake Keeper as he was called, grew too old to roll, his son Asp was given the sacred role of leader and high priest. He has ruled ever since. The next section is called Current Affairs and reads, The leader of the Vipers, Asp, inducts their ceremonies and administers duties. The members of the clan will follow his orders even if it meant death. 
Asp is usually in the same type of bone armor as the others, save he wears a snake skull as a helmet adorned with feathers and snakeskin as a cape. The Vipers are always dressed in bone armor. Their armor, as the name implies, is made from strips of bone bundled around the body with strips of leather. All Viper clan members have crude tattoos all over their bodies. Exotic piercings are not uncommon. The Vipers usually carry bone knives, bone spears, and sometimes pistols. Unquote. It's interesting this specifically mentions them using bone spears, as Aradesh still states this in dialogue. The Vipers and Khans both use spears. We know this from their attacks. The next section covers the Vipers' base, stating, The Vipers' hideout, or as they call it, the Shrine, is many small adobe buildings surrounding a large pit. This pit is where they conduct their religious ceremonies. The sacrifices are placed within the pit, and several huge pit vipers slither out to claim their meal. Although it has never happened, if anyone were to escape the great pit, the vipers would let that individual go, claiming it was the will of the great snake. An unfinished map intended for the Viper Shrine still exists, though unfortunately it's far from completion and doesn't have much worth talking about. Killian Darkwater, the mayor of Junktown, intriguingly comments that the Vipers are based somewhere north of the settlement. The Vipers are a crazy bunch from up north. They worship snakes or something. Interestingly, there's a small city ruin four squares north and one square east of Junktown, and perhaps this would have been where the Vipers were located. There's another set of ruins not far from the Brotherhood Bunker Lost Hills, but considering the Brotherhood's penchant for fighting raiders, it seems unlikely the Vipers' camp would have been placed so close to them. Kellyan also notes the Vipers are pretty chill compared to the Khans and even pass through town, suggesting some of their members might have been found here. Now there are two kinds, the Khans and the Vipers. We usually don't get trouble from the Vipers and a few of them actually pass through town. The Khans though, they're a mean bunch. They think they can conquer the world or some such crap. Picking back up in the Fall Bible, it states, quote, animosity. Both the Khans and Jackals hate the Vipers, but the Khans and Jackals hate each other more than the Vipers, so there is a nice little hatred pecking order going on, unquote. So at least one of the Vipers' quest revolved around destroying them for the Khans, and this seems to imply the Vipers were nearly as powerful as the Khans. The next section covers the Viper's outfits. Dress. Vipers typically dress in bone armor with a red sash, and their elite warriors are called the Crimson Tongue. Rituals. Once a month, the Vipers fall into a deep trance through a dangerous mixture of alcohol and snake venom. Anyone who doesn't awake is considered to have been found unworthy by the Great Snake. When the Vipers reach manhood, they are given a special mixture of the Pit Viper Venom. Those who die, or are in a coma for more than seven nights, are given as sacrifices to the children. The snakes in the pit are officially called the Children of the Great Snake. Those who survive the week-long delirium become Warriors of the Snake, also called Chosen Ones. There is also a monthly ritual, where the venom is taken by the high priest and priestesses of the tribe in small quantities, which causes bizarre dreams. This is called the Time of the Summoning, because many claim to see the giant snake come up to them in their dreams. When it is time for a captured prisoner to be sacrificed, he is typically hurled into the pit at midnight. Aside from Asp, there is at least one other personality mentioned as belonging to the Viper's band, a woman named Cobra, a brewer of the Viper clan, responsible for making the snake venom or extracting it from the pet vipers. She has a son named Fang, and her husband died long ago. In the original design documentation, there was an adventure seed for any characters coming across Garl from the Khans. He would task the player to go kill Asp and take a ceremonial helmet and dagger. Although Garl prefers the direct approach, he knows the Vipers rival the Khans in strength, and if Asp is killed, it has a good chance of scattering the Vipers. The next section is called Camp Breakdowns. The Pet. 
This is the large pet that lies in the center of the viper's camp. It currently holds four giant pet vipers. Each one is old and very well fed, but they are still very deadly. The pit itself branches off into many tunnels, where the player can find Faust old staff, as well as many nests of rats. One of the tunnels opens up into a secret exit near the mountains, so a resourceful player could use it to escape after being hurled into the pit." Unquote. This section is particularly interesting, as it implies the player could have been captured and then thrown down into the pit as a sacrifice. Presumably you would have had to fight off the pit vipers before finding the secret exit and escaping. The next part covers an area called the Sanctuary. This is where Asp sleeps and attends to the governmental duties of his people. His mate, the High Priestess of the Great Snake, is always close by. They have no children. The meeting room itself is long and lined with torches. The throne Asp sits on was made from skulls and bones of the two snakes that Faust killed during the Great Awakening. The Cages Where the prisoners are kept Located at the very edge of the oasis, they cannot taint the snakes with the unbelievers. These pits are dug into the ground. Their entrances are made of iron grates set into the stone ground of the oasis. They are usually guarded by the Crimson Tongue, the special elite warriors. The reason they are used to guard this is because a lot of the time the cages are used to hold these sacrifices to the children. This section is notable too, as it suggests the vipers would have had captives that the player could potentially rescue from a grim fate. The following section describes a location called the Halls of Ascension. This is the ceremonial lodge used in the time of summoning. This is also used for all religious purposes, except for the snake sacrifice, which is done on a platform set up over the pit. So there you are, all I could dig up on the vipers. Officially they exist in the Fallout universe, but they'll differ from the description above in the following ways. The vipers are from Vault 15. Mutated snakes do exist in the Fallout universe. Watch where you step. The viper's leader's name is unknown, but he was the first to discover the hallucinogenic effects of the mutated vipers. Anyone else injected with the undiluted venom either dies or goes into a coma. The vipers have no stable location. They wander the waste. The mass of snakes carried with them in a massive steel drum supported by slaves and brahmin. The final section on the vipers details how their lore was altered after they were cut and why they left Southern California. Defeated the Hub in 2125, their failed attempt to raid the Hub during the Hub's formative years stopped almost solely by Angus, the founder of the Hub. Angus's defense caused the vipers to retreat north, and they roam the waste for many, many years, occasionally attacking caravans and small settlements. Around the early 2150s, however, the vipers had grown to their former strength from captured slaves and caravan drivers, and had begun to establish a power base in the Badlands to the north of the hub, and south of the Lost Hills Bunker. Driven by a religious frenzy, and the need to provide for their much larger numbers of soldiers and disciples, they began raiding more frequently than before, attracting the attention of the Brotherhood of Steel. The Brotherhood sent out a few squads of scouts to track the raiders down. It was more of a training exercise conducted by John Maxon's father, as the Brotherhood was convinced that a small detachment of troops and power armor would be sufficient to deal with a group of raiders, no matter how large. Near extermination by the Brotherhood in 2155. One Brotherhood squad found the Vipers, and during the firefight, John Maxon's father, who was leading the squad, was killed with a poisoned arrow. The response from the Brotherhood was immediate. The Paladins, now led by Rhombus, began a full-scale campaign against the Vipers, tracking them down and wiping out almost all of their members within the span of a month. A handful of Vipers were able to flee north and east into the mountain range, but were never heard from again. 
During the campaign, the Brotherhood sent a few scouts and emissaries to the Hub to track down Viper's members, and from these beginnings the Hub and the Brotherhood began full trade relations. Caravans had delivered to the Brotherhood before, but not long after the destruction of the Vipers, caravan trains ran directly from the Hub to the Brotherhood on a regular basis. So some good did come out of the Vipers' presence in the Waste for what it's worth. During an interview, designer Jesse Heinig revealed why they were eventually cut. In conjunction with a couple of the folks in QA, I worked out some ideas for maps and quests based on early design documentation. Fallout's design docs were really constantly evolving, and sometimes a given iteration of the documents would just have a big hole, and you'd have to go back to earlier copies to find notes and rough ideas for an area. There were originally going to be two other raider tribes in addition to the Khans, the Vipers, and some other group, the Jackals. We had this idea worked out for the Vipers being in a cleft in a canyon, with some beat up wagons or motorhomes, and a sort of snake worshipping cult thing going on. There was gonna be a quest where you could become a honorary viper, and go through their pit of serpents and gain the snake eater perk for free. Sadly, we just didn't have time to actually build the map. The Snake Eater perk gives the player a 25% bonus to poison resistance, and this would have been a fitting reward for helping them out. Intrigued, I recently asked Jesse about the cut raiders on Twitter, and he replied, My original plan for the Vipers, but I didn't have time to implement them, was to make them kind of a snake cult. I like snake cults, okay? They would be a mix of fragmentary hand-down traditions from charismatic snake handling, indigenous culture knowledge, and misapplied fragmentary pre-war knowledge handed via oral history. Not much actual development was done on what kind of story they'd have for players to interact with, but there was a notion that you could ally with them, go through one of their snake handling rites, and gain a perk that gave you a high level of poison resistance. The Vipers were then intended to appear in Van Buren, where after fleeing the Brotherhood, they resettled to a small village in southern Utah called Ouroboros, which is Greek for tail-devouring snake. There they assimilated into another fanatical group of raiders, becoming known as the Hounds of Hecate, a reference to Hecate, a Greek goddess associated with witchcraft and magic. Hakate was the female leader of the faction and a lone survivor of the Twisted Hares after they were destroyed by Caesar's Legion. The Twisted Hares were the same tribe that Ulysses and New Vegas came from. The design document for the Ouroboros location reads, The Ouroboros is home to a raider clan known as the Hounds of Hecate, formerly the Vipers, and a religious organization known as the Daughters of Hecate. Both groups are run by a mysterious woman who claims to be the goddess Hecate herself incarnate. The Hounds of Hakate are a fierce tribe comprised of male members only. They are well equipped and specialize in various forms of unarmed warfare. The elite of the Hounds are also well versed in the use of melee weapons. All members of the tribe have been known to consume strange poultices before battle. Afterwards, they fight like the devil and seem almost immune to pain and injury. The tribe is unwavering in its loyalty to their goddess Hakate. Van Buren would later be cancelled though, and the Vipers were sadly cut once more. Now onto the Jackals. Their original incarnation is a bit of a mystery. It seems they were cut earlier than the Vipers or never even implemented, as they're never specifically mentioned in dialogue and work never began on a map for their base. Scott Campbell expanded on both the Vipers and Jackals in an interview, commenting, Fallout was a big game, even after many ideas were trimmed out of it. Some ideas were good, but just didn't fit with the world. Others were just too scope intensive. Others were just too silly. For example, the Desert Raiders were intended to have several warring factions, each with their own adventures and plot lines. The Jackals were a tribe of cannibals, preferring to eat their captives instead of each other. They were intended to be the low-level crazies that you battle at the beginning of the game. You would get a good reputation if you decided to wipe out their tribe. 
However, if you let them live, you would have a never-ending supply of crazy henchmen. The Vipers were another tribe of bloodthirsty raiders. These guys like to dress up in bone armor and find victims to sacrifice to their snake god, merge the Aztecs with the snake worshippers from Conan, and you're fairly close. Vipers throw their captives in an arena with a giant pet viper. Survivors are given the choice to become a part of the clan or sacrifice to their god. However, to be a part of their clan, you must perform several tasks to show your worth. Like hijack a caravan, raid a settlement, clear a rad scorpion nest, or retake a water source from an enemy group. Of course, you'd have a variety of options on how you solve each mission. In the end, if you did well, you'd have the respect of the tribe, and they'd protect you from all those pesky desert varmints when you were in their territory. The cons, the ones that did make it into the game, had its inception from a real-life biker gang, the Mongols. I was imagining the kind of tough, lawless SOBs that could survive in the desolation of the wasteland, raiding and killing for their spoils. I could see these guys surviving. So after a few generations, they became similar to the barbaric marauders they emulated. I also asked Jesse Heineg about them and he replied, The jackals were even less developed, so named because they were scavengers. Not just tech scavengers looking for bits of useful trash from the old world, but scavenging remains, trash, discards from other tribes or communities, including sometimes people who were exiled or lost. Brian Freyermuth also commented on them stating, one of the things that were cut from the original Fallout were the three raider factions. Originally, I came up with three tribes, the Vipers, the Jackals, and the Khans. The Vipers were your crazy mystics that worshipped the Cobra. Lots of human sacrifices and such. The Jackals were the scavengers of the group, always coming in after things had died and picking the carcass. The Khans were straight out of the Road Warrior, all metal armor and screaming battle cries. In the original design, you could actually befriend each, but because each was warring with the other, if you befriended one, it would alienate the others. All three tribes were collapsed down into one for budget reasons, but I still think fondly of them. There's so much to take away from these quotes. The Jackals would have been one of the first enemies the player faced, and by taking them out, you likely could gain some positive reputation and shady sands. On the other hand, you could help the Jackals out, and you'd receive cannibal companions to help you out during your travels. The Viper seemed to have a large number of quests planned in comparison to how many the Khans feature in the final game, and you have to wonder if both the Jackals and Khans would have had a similar number of quests if they were completely implemented. Finally, and probably the most interesting takeaway, is that you could join up with any of the groups and then destroy the others. This would have added a ton of replayability and might have been one of the most interesting quest lines of Fallout's first chapter. The only other information we have about the Jackal stems from Van Buren. They're mentioned in the Boulder Dome location document, and their camps would have been found in an open plain where they dug pits into the ground, living like animals. Their gang is numbered around 100, and they sported long hair and beards. If you were inside their camp, the Jackal kids would follow you around, sniffing at your heels. If you moved towards them, they would run away. A note mentions needing sounds recorded for human-like howls and metal banging on metal, and these noises would have been heard inside their camp. The men acted as authority figures, and their leaders were decided by strength and combat ability, much like the Khans. These crazed cannibals believe that human flesh is the source of their fertility, even believing that less fertile members of the tribe must have eaten a person who had an evil spirit. While they prefer to eat outsiders, they will eat members of their own tribe in desperation, starting with the weakest. When a male member of the tribe is killed, his wife and children are given to another male tribe member or eaten. Funnily, it's mentioned that the Jackals will have no respect for bald player characters, which is the best form of character creation discrimination I've ever heard of. They specialize in hit and run tactics, often firing once for the legs to slow down their prey. 
They like using sledgehammers in fights, clubbing foes like slaughterhouse cattle. They don't like ghouls, believing them to be the risen dead, and instead drive them away using ranged weapons. A note in the document states that they would run away from a fight if one-fourth of their group was killed, grabbing the bodies of the fallen as they escape, presumably to bring back to their camp and devour. The Fall Bible has one more point of interest regarding the Cut Raiders. Quote, in some ancient design documentation that I think was written by Scott Campbell, there was actually supposed to be three groups of raiders, the Jackals, the Khans, and the Vipers. Not only did they raid local towns and caravans, but they also preyed on each other. As you'll see from the descriptions below, their behavior and habits in F1 dictated or were dictated by their name choice, the Jackals. The first clan, the Jackals, is your typical group of crazies. They have no morals except one, survival. They use group tactics to overmatch their enemies. They are craven cowards though and will not attack unless they know they can win. They band together in their hideaway and fight over the spoils. The Vipers. The second clan, the Vipers, are mysterious followers of an ancient religion, or so they claim. They usually only come out at night to hunt for food or to conduct raids. They are very ruthless when it comes to combat. They prefer stealth to strength. They usually carry bone knives dipped in pit viper venom. This poison, when in the bloodstream, paralyzes the victim. Most victims captured in this way are taken back to their hideout. The Khans. The last group, the Khans, is probably the most dangerous. They live the lifestyles of Mongol warriors, raiding towns, burning what they cannot take, and capturing the survivors for use as slaves. They usually travel in small scouting bands, but sometimes they roam as full war parties. The Khans, above all else, respect strength. They are eager in combat to prove their worthiness to the clan by engaging in hand-to-hand -hand combat with fist or clubs. The Khans carry very few firearms since they are for cowards. Anyone showing superior strength is worthy of their respect. The leader of the Khans is so because no one has beaten them in combat. One interesting thing listed in the original documentation is that all raider bands were supposedly all from Vault 15, but they all splintered off into different groups from the overpopulated vault. All of these raider groups officially exist in the Fall universe, though only the Khans are in Southern California at the start of Fallout 1. The handful of vipers that survived Rhombus's campaign of extermination in 2155 fled north and east, following the same path the jackals took after they had their asses handed to them by the Khans 30 years before. Both the Vipers and Jackals would eventually appear as raiders in New Vegas, but sadly their war wouldn't be included and once again the Khans would get the spotlight. One of the only references to them is a loading screen tip that seems to imply they lost knowledge of their cultures over time. Brutalized by the NCR, the once legendary Vipers and Jackals gangs have become little more than opportunistic petty raiders. The only other reference to them that I'm aware of is a passing mention in Chief Hanlon's dialogue. The Colonel's an effective commander, one of the best. But she sharpened her claws on the Vipers and the old Jackals. Did four tours against the Brotherhood, too. She used to be a ranger until an injury took her out of action. Happens to a lot of us, unfortunately. She's better at making graves than making friends. Bring in more and the earth will be raised. Fields will be salted. While these references are a nice homage, they pale in comparison to the amazing ideas the developers of the first game envisioned. The Vipers in particular were a great attempt to flesh out a group of raiders, complete with their own unique rite of passage, occultic rituals, a religion worshipping mutated snakes, an organized hierarchy, and a rich history. Opposed to the generic murder hobos that have become a facet of the series, these changes would have made Fallout into an even better game. Ultimately though, all of this was left on the cutting room floor.